What's being done to support the mental health of lawyers? Are alternative routes to the profession as accessible as they're intended to be? And can you have a successful career within the law whilst also being a successful parent? I'm Dwayne Cormell, Managing Director of Round Recruit, an award-winning specialist legal recruitment consultancy based outside of Manchester. And in each episode, these are the sorts of questions I'll be trying to grapple with. I'll be inviting prominent lawyers to discuss and debate the key issues facing the legal profession today with unflinching honesty. Welcome to Refreshingly Honest Chats with Lawyers. Welcome back to another episode of Refreshingly Honest Chats with Lawyers. In this episode, I'll be discussing with my guest the topic of alternative routes to the legal profession. Lots of changes happened on this front in recent years, not least the introduction of the SQE and legal apprenticeships. So amongst other questions I want answering, I'd like to know, are solicitors still viewed favourably compared to legal executives? Are there enough educational resources provided out there in the big wide world that highlight alternative routes to law, particularly Silex? Are more alternatives needed to increase accessibility to the legal profession? And to discuss all of that and more, I'm really pleased to be joined by Gillian Lavelle, who will be attempting to answer those questions. Gillian started her career as a legal secretary straight from finishing A-levels in June 2004. She joined a law firm and enrolled on a legal executive course run by ILEX, as it was then known, in September 2004. Thereafter, she worked her way up the career ladder alongside continuing with her studies and qualified as a legal executive in 2010. She then decided to continue her studies and ultimately cross-qualified as a solicitor in June 2014. Now, she first started her career as practising in litigation, but she then moved into family law in the summer of 2010. She joined a current firm, Wigan Solicitors, in March 2015 and was promoted to partner in 2018 before finally becoming senior partner in 2020. Hi Gillian, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And yourself? I'm really good, yeah. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join me. I really appreciate it. I've already introduced you up to a point, but as I do with every episode, I'm going to ask you to start us off by giving a whistle-stop tour of your legal career up to this point, because I think that will give me and our listeners some good context for what we're going to discuss thereafter. Okay, um, I left school and did my A-levels, uh, which included law. Um, I then went to join a Legal 500 firm as a legal secretary, and I took the ILEX route whilst working until I qualified as a fellow of the Chartered Institute of ILEX in 2010. I then carried on studying through ILEX to finish the core modules as required on the degree to enable me to have the equivalent to a law degree, which then allowed me to um, do the LPC and qualify as a solicitor without a training contract. So I'm dual qualified as a legal executive and as a solicitor. Um, Throughout that, I remained in full-time employment and worked my way from legal secretary to paralegal to fee earner um solicitor and then i um gained partnership in may 2018 thank you that's really useful um and actually is a nice way to kind of lead to my first main question if you say that the traditional route inverted commas to, to becoming a solicitor is law degree followed immediately by the lpc Uh, And up to maybe 10, 15 years ago, that would usually include sponsorship from a law firm that had committed that you would become their trainee immediately after following, um, after a completion of the LPC, then onto your training contract. Can we then say that the route you've took is unconventional? It's the non-traditional route. Um, So I'd really like to understand with an increasing number of people going down alternative routes to the profession, what was it that spurred you to go down the path that you chose to take? Um, My A-level law tutor actually taught ILEX. Um, We were ILEX then, not Silex. Um, And she actually spoke to me about it. I don't think I'd heard about that route any other way. Um, My family couldn't afford for me to go to university. It would have been a lot of grants and a lot of loans and so on. 
and that wasn't something I really wanted to do. Um, so when my law tutor brought up this other route about being able to work and learn and still become what I wanted to be, it sounded like a perfect opportunity. Um, but yes, the law degree is the traditional route. <laughs> It is, but it doesn't make it the right one. And actually, there's a venture that I'm part of called Legal Job Coach, where we try to distill that information. Um, because actually, it's interesting hearing you say that it was your tutor that told you about the root ILEX, as it was called then, but you hadn't heard of it otherwise. Do, do you think there are enough educational resources that highlight the different ways to get into the legal profession, whether it be SILEX, as it's now called, or legal apprenticeships or, or whatever else is out there? I think we're much better now um, with legal apprenticeships really taking the forefront, I, I think, at the moment. You know, they're really being pushed, I think, through colleges from the information that I'm getting from students coming to me for work experience and things. But I still think Silex takes the background. Um, I think I had six work experience students over the summer and only one knew about Silex. I mean, I'm quite keen to talk it up when work experience comes in you know don't just think about the one route or this route you know because legal apprenticeships at the moment as well are so few and far between that they're nearly as difficult to obtain as training contracts and I think sometimes Alex is just as good if not better um, because you you get in at the, at the bottom and you work your way up and I think it gives you a better view of the whole job um, I don't know what the word is that I want to say as, as a whole because um, obviously when I was a fee earner, I could do a secretary's job, I could do a paralegal's job, and I could do the fee earner's job. And I think that's sometimes better because you understand what your secretary should be doing, what your paralegal should be doing. Rather than sometimes you come in from the conventional route, you qualify as a solicitor, you don't necessarily have that, that view and that work experience. Yeah, that's a good point. And I hadn't thought of that, actually. Um, the point you made there, though, that we're better at it, the profession, telling people about the different routes, but still Silex isn't particularly widely known about. I've got some stats here. So over 100,000 people have chosen Silex or Ilex, as it was called previously, as their route's becoming a lawyer since 1989, which I don't think is a huge number in the grand scheme of things, given the number of years we're talking about. Um, there's currently 20,000 members from paralegal through to sort of qualified level. Um, and around seven and a half thousand of those members are fully fledged chartered legal executive lawyers. So it would be helpful, I think, if I had the data that says the legal profession as a whole is this big. But but I think it would be fair to say that that's such a small part of the legal profession. So my question is, with that backdrop and the fact you're saying it, you know it's a really good, valuable route, why is it not talked up more? I don't know is the answer. Um, when I first started out on ILEX, not many people in, in the law firm I worked for knew about it. Um, it was looked down on slightly, shall we say. I think better now, again, more understanding. Um, but I think that's what spurred me on to be dual qualified um, because of some prejudice in some law firms as to what a legal executive is versus a solicitor. But I, I don't know why the ILEX, the SILEX are now looking into the SRA taking over their, um, call it like their qualifying board. Um, but I think that's still up in the air. Maybe that would bring more knowledge. I don't know. Every single episode, you know, it's usually not far in that we land on a point like this where we go, yeah, the legal profession, um, you know, it, it, you know, it's got some traditions and set ways of doing things that have meant it's lagged behind in some ways. Are you hinting at that when you, you know, you kind of get to the point that there's a bit of snobbery and that's maybe why this route isn't more widely advocated and taken up? Yes, <laughs> without wanting to push too much on it. I think better now again. I mean, when, when I was doing it, I was doing ILEX. It was like, what's ILEX? What's, what, what's the legal exact? And I'll be like, well, I can do the same job as you can do. Well, you can't because you've not got a law degree. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm qualified in this particular area of law, which gives me the same rights as you to be able to practice, to be able to be and to be able to give advice to clients. Um, but there was that a little bit of, yeah, disdain. 
um, or people not necessarily understanding what legal executives are and what they can do. Um, I think it's getting better, a lot better. Um, I mean, what we're talking 20 years ago, when I was first starting out on the eyelash route. So we have come on leaps and bounds since then. And hopefully we will continue to do so as a profession. And I think that's another point that most episodes that we also land on the point, uh, the, the guest I'm speaking with and I, that there is positive movement forward on a lot of these fronts within the within the profession. And it's no good to just paint the legal profession as being awful because it's absolutely not. Um, I've got some more stats I'd like to share if that's okay. Um, so 81.5% of Silex's members they do not have parents who attended university um, and only 2% of all members have a parent who's a lawyer or was a lawyer. On top of that, 41% of members had A-levels on joining and 21% had only GCSEs or O-levels and 75% attended a state school with just 9% going to fee-paying schools. Um, in fact, 17% of all members belonged to households that received income support or free school meals. I'd love to get your take on those stats. Um, it doesn't surprise me, I suppose. You know, I think, as I said, the conventional route is the degree, the LPC. So I suppose people who may not be able to afford to, to go down that route might choose the, the, the Silex route. Um, or they've worked in a law firm as a secretary, someone's spoken about it, and then they've gone on to, to, to do it that way. That would make sense to me. I mean, I don't have parents that went to university. Um, I attended a state school. But, you know, it doesn't stop you. If that's what you want to do, then you just need to push forward. But, yeah, no, it doesn't surprise me. Um, but, again, I think... I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say, I'm afraid. Well, no, but I, I think they don't surprise me either. Um, and I alluded to legal job coach earlier that, uh, and that one of the key things that we tr try to do, those of us that are involved in it, is is disseminate this kind of idea that there are other routes to the profession precisely because of stats like that. You know, like, like you, I went to a state school and my parents didn't go to university. And I think it's important that there are more accessible routes to the profession which is why it's great that there are an increasing number of alternative routes. But I suppose it's just a pity that when that data suggests that this is such a powerful route for people that wouldn't otherwise be able to access it, that, that you know, a light's not shone upon it more and it's not shouted about more and it's not promoted more. It definitely should be. I mean, you can become a partner, you can become a judge, you, you know, you can do anything down this route. There is... There's no limitations on the role, so it, it completely should be. But I think again, legal apprenticeships, which are a great thing, are now being more they're more in the limelight now than Silex, which I think 20 years ago Silex was your apprenticeship route. It just wasn't called that because you got a job and you, and you went to. I mean, I took an afternoon off and I went to one afternoon and one night school, you know, and that's how I did it. So it was like an apprenticeship without necessarily being called an apprenticeship. Um, but now, obviously, you can do your degree through an apprenticeship. I think people are focusing more on that, which is a shame because I think this is a great route to follow. We mentioned apprenticeships there. Um, I'm coming with more stats again, so forgive me, Gillian. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, solicitor apprenticeships, the number on offer jumped 40% in 2020 on the previous year. Do you think then that, these alternative routes are becoming more widely accepted by employers only only hinted i think in a prior answer that you know there is a little bit of snobbery around maybe about the kind of routes that some people take to the profession i think it's better now um i don't think legal apprenticeships are frowned on at all um because she's technically still doing a law degree um but you're just working at the same time as doing it so i don't think there's any any issue with that at all um I mean, we, we have um, an apprenticeship solicitor working with us at the moment, um, which is, you know, a learning curve for us all, trying to work out how to navigate these new new ways of um, qualifying. Um, but, the, the, yeah, I think I think they've become more and more popular. Um, and hopefully, you know, it, it negates the need for 
people fighting over training contracts, which was a big thing when I when I was younger and you know, I was sat there quite happily as a legal exec typing away and there's <laughs> fifty pound legals trying to argue over three training contracts. It was horrific. So I think this is a great thing to try and get more people into the profession. Would well, you know what from where I'm sitting, I think that fighting over training contracts continues to this day. And I think what it does is fuel a lot of unnecessary movement of jobs at paralegal level where paralegals, if you know, that if they don't get their training contract in 12 months and they're going to jump to another firm. And I, I just wonder whether or not, you know, I may be repeating the point I made already, but we need to shine a light on not just apprenticeships, but also Silex and, and every other different way of being a route, a valid route to qualification to, to prevent that, that wastage. I agree. I mean, I've had people who I've worked with as paralegals in the end cross convert to a legal exec because they've not been able to get the training contract. Um, they've not been able to qualify. You know, and again, that's routes that, that are available to those with, you know, with the, the traditional law degree. You can cross convert, you can qualify as a graduate member of Silex straight away. And then you have your two year training period. So I've seen people do that before. Um, again, another route. Would they have known about it if I hadn't spoken about Silex at the time? I don't know, because it's not pushed enough. Um, and I really think it should be. So as someone that's gone through that Silex route, but also someone that's a decision maker in a law firm, I think you've got a relatively unique take on this. Um, what are the main obstacles, in your opinion, to more firms taking up these alternative pathways? I, I mean... I work for a small firm. I think bigger firms take on more legal apprenticeships and things like that anyway. Um, the, the, the lady we have doing the legal apprenticeship came as work experience and then never left. And then it just became natural to say, you know, I know you want to do a law degree. Let's look at the different routes available. You know, and that, that's the way we we did it. Um, I have some staff working through ILEX at the moment that have worked in law firms for numbers of years but never had any qualification. And we spoke about ILEX and, you know, and they're going down that route or they've come to me halfway through ILEX. So there is more talk about it now, I think. Um, I'm just trying to think what your question was. I'm not sure if I've answered it fully or not. Just Well, I'm, I'm trying to, I suppose, understand what are the obstacles in the way of more firms taking it up. Um, but I'm, I'm jumping on something you've said then and actually something you said in your introduction too. You joined a legal 500 firm early on in your career, so you've experienced that sort of setting and you've also now experienced a, set, uh, a smaller firm setting. And I'm wondering from your answer you've just given, is there something in this that a lot of people going down these routes are kind of championed to go down the routes by others in these small firms that have tended to go down them themselves versus the bigger legal 500 firms where it's maybe not the norm and so it doesn't get spoken about and people that might benefit from it don't simply because there's nobody there that's already done it that can champion that route? Hmm. I think when I joined the, my first firm straight from college, I think I was the, possibly, I'm not going to hold myself to it, but I think I was possibly the first one to go down that route. And then from there, after I'd, um, I think I was one or two years in, they then offered it to the firm. And there was a couple more then that took it up to other staff. So, um, I mean, they may have already had legal executives already qualified, but I think I feel like I was the first one to start afresh as a legal secretary and to start that um, career path. And I think they, they did then push on it and offer it to other people who was already as legal secretary, that anyone wants to progress, that anyone want to do this, um, which I thought was brilliant. So I think some of the bigger firms are, will if they see it working, they will, they will go with it. Um, some of the smaller firms, if they, some smaller firms with older members of partners, maybe a little bit behind the times, but I think as younger partners are coming through who know about different areas and different routes, you know, they're more open to taking those on. That's an interesting take because I think actually it's just um, ripped apart what <laughs> I was maybe kind of cementing as large firms not for it small firms absolutely for it but no it's it's more nuanced than that isn't it from based on the answer you've given i think so i mean it's only my perspective um 
I mean, when I came to the firm that I'm at now, the firm made partner, my boss was amazing. He, he was open to everything, um, new ways of learning, and I think that's great. Um, but some firms obviously are more stuck in the traditional roots. But as I said, as more younger people are becoming partners who are more open to um, new ways of learning, new ways of qualifying, and I think then it will become more and more acceptable to qualify in any way. But I think legal apprenticeships will now overtake Silex again. That's my gut feeling um, that people are going to go down because it's still a traditional law degree, which is unfortunate. We might come back to that then, that, that apprenticeships are going to potentially overtake Silex and that may or may not be a good thing. But I, I want to pick up on the partner point because you're a partner and, and I've got even more data in front of me um, that tells me that only 250 chartered legal executives have become partners in law firms and you're one of that number. How does that make you feel? Wow. Amazing. Um, I didn't know that statistic, so thank you. Um, I think it's fantastic. It just shows that you can do a non-traditional route into law. And, um, you know, as a woman as well, you know, we, we are few and far between. So it's brilliant as a woman, as a legal exec. Um, as in a solicitor that I've, that I've got this far, but it just shows hard work and um, you can achieve anything you want to. So going back to your point about legal apprenticeships potentially overtaking Silex, um, can you share with me why you don't think that's necessarily a good thing? I think it just stops. If it's not promoted, it's people then not having that option to get to qualify in a different route. I mean, the legal apprenticeship route and you have to f correct me if I'm wrong. It's five years, seven years. It's a long time, um, and you you do the traditional law degree, and you cover obviously a full range of the areas of law as required by the degree. But with ILEX, if you have a specific interest in one area of law, you know you can just qualify into that particular area. You don't have to do seven years worth of study. You can just do um, that that specific area. Um, which is great because then you qualify, you have to become a specialist in that area rather than a general knowledge of everything. Um, but I think legal principles have definitely been pushed in colleges at the moment. That's the feeling that I'm getting from the um, work experience students that I've had. Um, but as I said, not, not many people know about the silent route. I think sometimes older um, candidates tend to go down the silent route. That's, that's the feeling that I'm getting rather than fresh out of college like I did it. So would it be fair to say you're suggesting we need to be careful, the profession needs to be careful, not to over advocate legal apprenticeships in trying to kind of create more opportunity and accessibility at the expense of actually kind of drowning out other routes like Silex that are potentially just as valuable? Yeah, I think they need to all be equally advertised. You know, it would have been great at 18 if they said, right, here's, four different options that you could do to become a lawyer which is obviously what i wanted to do you can do i mean legal apprentices weren't out at that point but you know legal apprenticeship ilex you know the traditional law degree i mean i'm sure there's plenty more different different ways in you know to be able to say look at all the different options and work out which one is best for you because as i said as a legal apprentice you've got to get one with a little bit of training contract you've got to Speak, get get to know a firm, firms have to be agreeing to offer them um, and you need to get them. As a Lila, as you can just get a job as a legal secretary, you can get a job as a junior in an office firm, you know, and, and begin your career that way. And then obviously, once you've got a little bit of knowledge under your belt, you can apply for something a bit higher and you're not necessarily bound to a particular firm for five, seven years. I really need to check how many years it is. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to give you anything more concrete than that. <laughs> I should know, as I said, I have an apprenticeship solicitor with me at the moment. Um, but I just think it's like you're not you're not bound to a firm. You can literally start your legal career yourself without having the firm say to you, "Oh, yes, I'll give you an apprenticeship," and that's if you're lucky enough to get one. Because apprenticeships, you know, they are notoriously difficult, just like training contracts. But with Silex, I think I just got a job in a law firm. You know, I started my um, Silex route after a year. I thought right, I think I'm ready to go on and I applied for a paralegal job, you know, and just slowly built my way up. And I think it's at your own pace as well. Um, 
I, I, I think it's a fab way. You know, you know, you're not bound to anyone. You can move firms. You can do whatever you want, whatever is in your heart's desire. <laughs> and I think, I think I'm sensing that a key advantage of this route over and above others is that you're earning whilst you're progressing and and kind of progressing and learning, which is relatively unique of the different routes on offer to get into the legal profession. And I think is a really important one um, against that backdrop of accessibility and those stats that I shared around what, what the body of Silex looks like. Yes. Um, again, I'm not, I can't quote it, but obviously an a legal apprenticeship, I imagine there is um, apprenticeship recommendations as the salary. But again, if you do it in Silex and you've got a job as a legal secretary, then you get paid as a legal secretary, right? If you get a job as a paralegal, you get paid as a paralegal, right? You know, and um, I came out of Silex with no, with no debt. I, I paid it all as I went along, um, which was fantastic, you know, to uh, another paralegal sat next to me is in £10,000 worth of debt, you know, and they've got a law, de- they've got the law degree, but they've not got any work experience. You know, on paper, if you can say I've worked as a secretary, I've worked as a paralegal, I'm now applying for a fianna's job, I've got four years of experience behind me, I've got my ILX, I'm in no debt, I just think you, 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 you're in a better position than with no offence to my fellow solicitors, um, someone's in a better position, you know, on paper. Would you have a legal exec with 10 years of experience versus a solicitor that might only have one or two, but nearly qualified? And um, my view has always been work experience tends to triumph. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm slightly biased. <laughs> well... <laughs> why shouldn't you be because you've gone down this route and it's worked so well for you so i think i'd be surprised if you said anything <laughs> anything other than what you have just said you've touched on this in the answer you've just given and in fact throughout our conversation but for the benefit of our listeners any that might be thinking okay this silex route might be for me what would you say are the key advantages of going down that pathway over and above other routes to the profession um, debt free, work experience, and as I said, learning from the ground up, which I think is invaluable. Um, you still have rights of audience. You can still become a judge. You can still become a partner. Why not? You're not, you know, you're not tied. As I said, you're not tied into a particular law firm. You could do a secretary job in one law firm. There's no paralegal jobs here. Oh, there's a paralegal job here. You can move without being tied in as an apprenticeship. You're tied into however many years. I still don't know <laughs> to a specific law firm. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's a great way to go, personally. Thank you. And I think on that point about us not being able to clearly state what the time for apprenticeships is, I think it would be responsible um, of me to make sure in the notes that accompany this episode, and um, we include different links to plenty more factual information about what the apprenticeship looks like and <laughs> yeah. as well as the silex route for anybody thinking about any of these routes so it's there and readily available to them but um i think as we move towards the kind of back end of the, the conversation i want to kind of move us a little bit um do you think a lawyer's educational background has historically impacted their potential to progress within law i think historically yes yeah. Um, and I think you can still see it at some senior level of judges now, um, but not now, I wouldn't say, not now. I think we have moved on leaps and bounds since then, um, definitely. But I think maybe many years ago, you know, where you studied law would have had an impact on where you got a training contract, but if you got a training contract and how you then progressed. And thinking back to the data I shared about the number of partners that have gone down the Silex route. Again, I don't have data that shows what percentage of the overall profession that is, but I would be surprised if that data said anything other than actually as a proportion, that's lower than the overall proportion of Silex that make up the profession. So as somebody that has gone down that route and has become a partner, are there any things that you can identify have helped you to get to that point that you could share with our listeners? I think a lot of it has been experience. Um, I mean, I'm quite a young partner for for a law firm. Um, But I think because I started my law career at 18, 
you know, having 21 or 23, depending on when you've done your degree in LPC, or even 25 by the time you've got a training contract. You know, I'm already seven years up on my work experience than the average newly qualified solicitor. Um, but I think a lot of it's that, you know, work experience, knowing the different roles. Um, I think that's helped me a lot. You know, I, as I said, I worked as a secretary, I've worked as a paralegal um, before becoming a Fiona. I think, and I suppose being in the right place at the right time sometimes helps, doesn't it, as well? I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> My penultimate question, um, I'd like you please to just share what it looks like that silex route then what the kind of key milestones are what somebody that's potentially thinking of going down that pathway should expect um i think it has changed the, the route itself from when i did it because when i did it it was three core subjects and a practice subject at level six and you had your level four which was a level equivalent um i think that still stands but i think you now have to do a portfolio and you have to do legal research and writing so it's a little bit um harder I think than when I did it the, the initial route but once you've got your you know your four subjects and you, you pass that you have a two-year training period but it's not where you have to have a training contract it's just you are fearing you are working in a law firm that is equivalent training so you're not having to fight as we, we alluded to before uh, you know over a training contract and once you've got those two years as long as your your employer is happy you know they sign you up and you become you become a chartered fellow of the Institute of Legal Executive, and that's fantastic. And what does the process from that point to dual qualifying as a solicitor look like? When I did it, you could then go back and finish the course subjects to get your equivalent law degree. Um, I don't know whether you can still do it. I don't know. Um, I'd, I, I would definitely have to look into it. But as said, because we're talking... 20 years ago um but then you could you could carry on you could do literally all the core subjects um, and then you would apply then to to have a, a certificate to say you've completed basically an equivalent to a degree which then allowed you then to go on the lpc but then you again qualify with no training contract as a solicitor um i mean i took a year out after my ilex to just have a break from studying um and then just went back to it and carried on. So, yeah, but I'm not sure as we can still do it. There's another benefit that if it's still possible, I don't think you necessarily listed earlier, it's the flexibility of it to, to sort of pick up with it, put it back down according to whatever else maybe you've got going on in your life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I think I just had enough of studying at that point, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I there was any particular reason why. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, children, family issues, you know anything but you can pick it up you can put it back down again go back to it you know there is that flexibility again not so much with the traditional law degree or a legal apprenticeship you can't just pick, you know halfway through your degree just go actually i think i'll have a six months out thank you very much <laughs> um and i think with the apprenticeship it, you know it can be just as difficult to say actually i need a break so there is a lot more flexibility to it but it's your own pace on your own terms finally then i would like to finish off by asking you what you think the future holds for the profession when it comes to alternative routes to qualifying um i think a lot more flexibility a lot more openness um i hope obviously silence continues and more and more people take it up obviously there's the legal friendships which are great you know that that's a that's a very new thing in the last few years um so hopefully we will continue to to welcome everyone with open arms brilliant well thank you so much for joining me um i think you're the first person that i've had on this series that's silex and it's been really nice kind of hearing your experience i know you've said a few times you know it was however many years ago that i did it but i think that's all the better because actually you've you've done it that long time ago and you've gone on to have the career that you've had and I think that gives you a really interesting take on the subject so thank you for sharing that with me no problem at all thank you for having me as i do every single time i get to record an episode of refreshing the honest chats i had a great time talking to a member of the legal profession um my biggest takeaway from my conversation with, with Gillian actually was something that came up really early on 
in our discussion being that Silex is just not a widely known about route. And that came through both in what Gillian said about how she only found out about it originally going back, I think, 20, 20 so years because her A-level tutor also happened to teach Ilex as it was then known as right through to, to kind of present day now, Gillian saying that of six people she's had recently do work experience at a law firm, only one of them knew about it. So for me, it seems that whether or not somebody considers going down the Silex route is left a lot to chance around whether or not they know somebody else that's taken that route previously. And that's in no way meant as a slight on Silex's advertising and marketing strategy. Um, but on the subject of that, actually, if they were looking for a brand ambassador, then they ought to look no further than Gillian because she could only say good things about Silex as an alternative to the so-called traditional route. And actually, when you consider its flexibility, its potential to allow you to earn whilst you learn, the avoidance of having to fight out with other people for the, the prize that is a training contract, the not necessarily being bound to one particular law firm whilst you undertake your apprenticeship or training contract. Well, you know, it's not hard to see why she would advocate so strongly for it when it's um, paved the way for her getting to where she's got to. I also noted a take on legal apprenticeships and that they might not necessarily be the best of the alternative routes that are on offer for everyone. And I think I'll try to explore that in a future episode with somebody that's gone down that route or is going down that route and see whom that route is best suited to. And to finish me off, as always, you are welcome to connect with our guest on LinkedIn. I'll make sure we share their details in the summary that gets posted with the episode. You'll also see that we will publish on realmrecruit.com the full written transcript of this episode, as well as previous episodes and future episodes, and lots of other stuff uh, that will help you develop your legal career. And I would encourage you to sign up for our mailing list that will give you even more of that sort of stuff, which leaves me to just thank you for joining me today for Refreshingly Honest Chats with Lawyers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe and share if so, and please join me next time.